So there's there's some more interesting stuff to talk about, um, and I'm going to go through some of this stuff relatively briefly. Um, and some of these things may not make a lot of sense, and that's fine. Stop me if you have questions or don't. It's, it's up to you. Um, the first the one thing I haven't talked about at all is that it, the, the GPUs are always, you know, I always say you a thread writes to a specific place based on some index. Well, a lot of times when you're doing a sum or when you're doing something, um, you may want threads to increment a counter. I did this, maybe, maybe you want to count the number of ones in your data or count the number of failures or whatever. They're, typically those counters live in a single place. So how do all threads in a block update the same place? Well, there are hardware-assisted atomic operators that, that allow you to do this. Um, and they work, they're, they're, they work fine, but they do serialize execution. Um, so you, you need, to, you need to, to be wary of that. And, and it's just this atomic increment. And you give it a pointer to what you want, and um, what thread, sorry. I'm actually, I don't know what that, that parameter is. Because this is an increment operation, it's going to increment what's at that address by one, and I don't remember what that parameter is for. So they're pretty easy to use, um, and and in a lot of parallel cases, and a lot of uh, scientific computing, that happens a lot. So it was it was kind of critical that they had that, and this is all hardware assisted, so you don't have to have semaphores or anything like that. So this is not directly related, but the examples you've all shown thus far have been in C, right? Yes. Is C the only API into CUDA? Okay, so. Um, the CUDA, I, so I would have said yes until I read some news yesterday. I think CUDA might be officially supported in Python now. Okay. Um, there's but traditionally, it's been all C. Yeah, it's all C, and there's there's a few extensions. So there's some, I think there's like three syntax extensions that they've had for CUDA code. Um, there's that uh, double underscore you saw, underscore, underscore, global. So those two underscores, and then when you launch a kernel, I didn't show that, um, there's triple angle brackets, kind of like three template kind of parameters, um, but everything else is C. Straight C will work, some C++ will work. So you can do kind of objects, and uh, but you can't do things like polymorphism and stuff like that, but it will do objects and it will do templates. And then. NVIDIA is providing the compiler. You're not using GCC to compile this. Um, it does. It, you, it provides um, NVCC, which is the NVIDIA CUDA compiler. And for C code, that will invoke GCC for you. And it will compile all your C code and that's C code. And then the CUDA compilation process is somewhat complicated. Um, and it, it breaks it down and it rewrites everything in kind of this ASCII assembly which is actually pretty neat because you can go and you can look at the assembly instructions that the GPU is doing and you can say, oh, I don't want it to do that, and maybe. So it does that and then the CUDA compiler turns that into CUBIN files or something like that. Um, but yes, it's all, it's basically all C. Even the kernel code looks just like C. But it spits out one executable at the end of the day. Um, uh, it does, So you, but you can link it. Um, you. you you link it, you can link it against regular C code. Okay. So it's, it's, it's not... And it, the linker handles knowing what to offload to the GPU yes. or what to offload Yeah, so um, when you, when you want to actually call these functions, you make, um, you make, I guess they're similar to API calls in a library, and then that handles the, okay. it handles the population, it handles waiting for them to return, all, all that sort of device interaction stuff is handed, handled by, for you in these library calls. But there is a movement towards supporting some of this stuff in Python. I, I think the officially they might have done that. Um, I, this week is their big event, and I think I might have read something like that. There are Java bindings. There are all these different bindings. I hope, you know, I know Python already had these bindings, um, but I've never, really, I haven't used too many of them, so I'm not exactly sure how they work. And is CUDA strictly NVIDIA specific then? Yes. Okay. CUDA is a NVIDIA only. Um, API, programming language, uh, whatever you want, environment. Um, and so, uh, just a little bit of an aside, the difference is it only works on NVIDIA things. Um, OpenCL, so 
NVIDIA cards support OpenCL, so you can write OpenCL. But OpenCL um, has its own compilers. So if you write OpenCL for an NVIDIA device, you need to use the NVIDIA compiler. So what the NVIDIA compiler does is it translates all your OpenCL code to CUDA code and then okay. compiles that. But OpenCL is an effort to put a generalized interface yes. in front of all this so you don't, I mean, so, so it'll, it'll run, run on any old GPU and whatever needs to happen to get to run on that GPU is handled for you behind the scenes. Yes. You basically, all you really need to define is the logic of your, your kernel and it handles everything else. Um, and the same thing will run on on a, a huge honking NVIDIA GPU, it'll run on an Intel mic, it'll run on a, a Xeon, whatever it is. That's kind of the idea. No, but like NVIDIA's not doing the same thing with OpenGL. Like OpenGL actually has hardware support yes. on the card, right? So right. we may get to the point where there is OpenCL hardware support and you're not going through this CUDA translation. I, I, I think eventually we will, um, just because I think that the whole multi-core thing will continue to grow and we'll, we'll to have that go anywhere, we'll need that. Um, but at the moment, NVIDIA doesn't really have any specific interest in doing that. Right, right. Because they market cornered. To, to be, well, yeah, and, and to be honest, their API and their programming interface is way better than OpenCL. OpenCL is pretty heinous. Um, it, it's, it's not overtly difficult or anything, but it's, it's, there's lots of boilerplate, it's just, it's pretty difficult. And it's difficult because that same code is going to run on vastly different architectures. So, um, yeah, everything's in C and maybe a little bit of C++. You cannot do recursion. That's, that's the, one of the main restrictions. Um, and you can't do polymorphism and things like that. It's very straight C kind of like. So, uh, when you when you write when you write your code and you're like, oh, it's not quite fast enough, um, you, you really need to do these these metrics. There's all sorts of metrics that you can calculate to figure out what's going on, and they're they're not any different than the standard CPU metrics when you do CPU performance analysis. Um, you know, you're going to compare the number of reads to global memory to the number of floating point operations. And, and if that number is low, if you're doing more reads than actually math, you're just memory bound. So it's, there's just nothing you can do about it, but you need to optimize memory. So you know if that's the, or if that's the situation you're in, you have to you know, care about how, if you're doing an extra add, you don't care about if you're, you know, your algorithm maybe is a little bit off or takes a little longer. All you care about is getting stuff on the car the fastest. That's, that's what these type of metrics will tell you. Um, so maybe, you know, when you look, the ideal situation is you read something from global memory and you use it 17 times or a whole bunch of times instead of just once. You know, that's kind of what you want because you want to get as much math out of each read as possible. And then, um, <clears throat> at an even lower level, there's this concept of, of bus utilization. And, this is a pretty advanced kind of thing you need to worry about is back to those misaligned addresses. So if you're, if you're on a boundary um, and you have, this is your 128 byte boundary, but you have one, you have 129 threads and you need, you need this one. And all these threads are all coalesced and that's great, but now you're getting this one as well. Unfortunately, just like on a CPU, when you make a memory request, you get more than the one thing you asked for. You get a whole page of 4K or 8K or whatever it is on these things. Um, on the GPU, you're not going to get that much, but you are going to get, I think, 64 bytes minimum. So you're going to get the next 64 bytes no matter what if you just you want this one thing, right? So in that case, the traffic along the bus for this request, you're getting like one eighth of the utilization. So these are the type of metrics you use um, when you're trying to optimize your memory. And there's ways that you can deal with this um, or to mitigate this. And you know, I can talk about that a little bit more, but it's not super important. Um, so there's all sorts of these metrics, like how many times does each memory read get used, how many math operations per read, et cetera. Um, yeah. Okay. So here's an actual concrete example of some of the, like, how bad some of this stuff can get. So 
remember our matrix um, matrix example. We need to calculate a single index to read from. So to calculate a single index, whether it's doubly indexed or you you you, you use the width and you just calculate the single number, um, you do the, the the code at the top there. With loads and stores and addition and all that, it works out to be about 15 assembly instructions to calculate i and j. It's just about what it is. So if you have a, a million elements you're operating on, for every million elements, you need to do at least 15 index instructions just to calculate what to read. So it's kind of a lot, right? Um, so the idea here is that let's let's back that off. Let's figure out a way to mitigate that. So what we can do instead is we have to pay that cost up front at some point. So we do. But now that we have an index, we've already done a lot of these calculations. We've done the lows, we've done the stores, we've done the multiply, we've done the add. Now let's use that. Let's leverage all that work we just did and get another index for one operation. And we can do that by adding some constant blocked in to what we just calculated. So we, we, we calculate our index, we do our load, we do the math on, on whatever it is we loaded, and now we still have this index. Let, let's load something else right then and there. So we reduce the number of index calculations we have to do. So this, this thread will now be operating on two elements. It'll do its one thing, it'll do an add, and then it'll do that same thing it just did on the next element it loaded. So since every thread is doing two operations um, for a million elements. Basically, we have 500,000 threads instead of a million threads. And 500,000 threads only need to do 16 instructions instead of a, thousand, a million threads doing 15 instructions each. So we get a, a savings of approximately 50%. I mean, just by that one thing, now we've reduced the number of instructions by a ton. So these are the types of issues you run into when it comes to the raw performance of these cards. Like you, you would never worry about this in a CPU environment. Just you would just write your code, and it wouldn't be an issue. Even if you were optimizing, you worry more about cache hits and cache lines than you would about this. So this is the type of thing. It's a little weird. It takes some getting used to. Um, so every thread is now doing two operations. But now, what does that mean? It means maybe you use more registers. Maybe you can fit less threads. Maybe you don't have enough threads, so there's all, all that stuff we talked about earlier now affects, is affected by this decision. So it's, there's a lot that goes into the, these like really, really high level or, or really detailed optimizations. Um, so where does the constant get defined? Or is it just something that happens in the background? This? Yeah. So, um, if, you, if I could show you, try. Um, so remember how we have threads and thread blocks? Yeah. So if we have, you know, um, if that's one thread block and it's going to read all the data, it, it's going to read, you know, we, from a single thread, let me, let me draw all the thread blocks in, in the standard case, right? So let's say we have six thread blocks and these thread blocks basically just map right onto the data. We need to know the number of, we need to know how big our data is before we can determine how many thread blocks we have. So that, that's given, you know how much data you have. And from that, you calculate how many thread blocks you have based on how many threads in each thread block. Okay? So then, if what we're doing is we're saying, oh, each thread is going to process half, uh, twice as much data. So typically, the thread block, if this is our, our huge thing of data, right? Typically, we just kind of map this right on here. So this thread block will process all that data that sits in, in those memory locations. But instead, it's going to do that, and it's going to do this. So we need half the thread blocks in that case. because it, it, And, and it, this sounds a lot more complicated than it is. Um, if we looked at some code, it would be pretty obvious. So block dim is how many threads you have Y. So basically, this thread here is going to read that piece of data, and then it's going to read this piece of data. Because that, this distance is thread block dim. That, that constant. Well, so I was wondering, where is it defined? Like, 
do you define it elsewhere? Or does it because it seems like it's dependent upon what it is for a die. Um, or at least that was kind of what I was interpreting. Say that again. It, so the constant, at least from what I understood of it, this constant, yeah, uh -huh. looks like it's dependent upon the first the multiplication in into it. Um, no. So this line here. Well, let's just go through this uh, pretty detail. This line is what block am I in? So which one of these am I? Times how wide the block is. So if we're in, you know, we're over here, we need this plus which thread we're in. Then we know how far across we are. And then from there, we know every thread. There's only block dim threads. Okay. There's only, that's how many threads there are that by definition. Mm -hmm. So there can't be more than block dim. There can't be less than block dim. Okay. We could, I could have replaced this constant with that, and it probably would have been a little bit easier to understand. Mm -hmm. uh, but I did it for so it would stand out. Sorry about that. Because no every block is the same amount of threads. Yeah. So we only we know that we're only going to read block dim dot x in that direction. So at the end of that, if we want to read twice that much, every block reads block dim that the one they initially read plus the block dim to get the next one. Yeah. And what that does is all these these reads here get coalesced, and then the next ones get coalesced too. Mm -hmm. So this is typically you want to have each thread do as much work as possible. Um, so we're going to need to wrap up here in a few okay. minutes, but uh, I guess my question would be, if I wanted to go home and start playing with this, like where does one go to get started? Sure. Um, so the, I, I, I would start with CUDA. I, I mean, you could start with OpenCL, but I would start with CUDA. Um, when you download on the NVIDIA website, you download CUDA, it comes with a couple things. There's, you need to have a, a driver. So if you have a Linux system, you're going to have to probably build the driver, and it's kind of difficult, well, not difficult, but it's somewhat of a pain to do. Um, so you do that. It also comes with all the libraries. It comes with the compiler, the visual profiler, um, a bunch of other, uh, there's like a debugger, um, a memory checker, all sorts of these tools that you can use. And that allows you to write and do all your own good stuff. Lastly, it comes with this huge samples uh, collection of a bunch of existing code that you know is mostly didactic in nature. That you can basically learn how to do all this stuff from. And it's I was gonna if we had time today I was gonna I was gonna bring it up. Um, actually, I can show you this real quick. Um, so you know here's here's an example of a kernel. Oh, that's not the kernel. So here's. Here's a kernel for a, a, um, an OpenGL kind of a uh, program. And just I think So this is what it does. Um, and it's using OpenGL to do the graphics. But all the calculations of what points are where are done using CUDA. And one of the things that you can do with CUDA is um, you can share OpenGL buffers. So you can write all your graphics code in OpenGL and then export the, those um, vertex buffer objects to CUDA. And it can manipulate them and change all the values. And then when you draw it again, they have the new values. It's kind of neat. Um, so this, this collection of samples is extremely useful and, and there's a lot of wealth in the sample. So you go to the NVIDIA website, you download that stuff, and then you get this to build and you'd start maybe with this one because it's pretty easy. Um, and there's some other ones too. But that's that's what I would do to start. Um, yeah. And is it kind of CUDA or OpenCL right now? Are there, I mean, does ATI have a player in this game? Uh, ATI did, they had something called Stream and they, they canceled that because it didn't, I don't know why they canceled it. Um, and they, they've gone to fully support OpenCL now. So they actually have a, um, an OpenCL compiler and all that stuff. So the, those are pretty much your choices. It's CUDA or OpenCL. Uh, for GPU stuff, yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And does, 
So like built-in GPUs on like new Intel chips, do they are they open CL? Though that would be open, most likely open CL. Okay. Yeah. Um, Intel has a couple other things that it does. Uh, there's a name of something I don't remember what it is. Um, they they had their they had their own stuff. Um, the newest ones will have mic on them, which is kind of the Intel Intel was doing Laravee, which was their version of GPUs, and they canceled that and they did mic now. Okay. Um, so that will have those. But there are people doing this kind of stuff on embedded GPUs, not just big, you know, discrete NVIDIA graphics codes. You, um, you mean like or on chip? On, on chip GPUs. I think so. I'm not entirely sure. Um, most of those those GPUs are Intel GPUs. Right. So I've gotten I've I've gotten the Intel OpenCL compiler to work for a Core i7, but I have I don't have an Intel GPU, so I don't know. I I assume that it works, but I, I don't. So, cool. Any, any other questions? Um, I'll just wrap up real quick. Um, the the takeaway stuff is that this stuff can do some pretty amazing things, and it's really fast in some cases. But it's it can be difficult and hard to get all this stuff right, and that's like I said, one of the reasons it hasn't taken off. Um, you got to transfer all this stuff across the PCI Express bus. Bad. The memory is really weird and difficult. Bad. You have to worry about things like bus utilization to get all the performance you can. Application programmers and even systems programmers don't really care about <laughs> bus utilization. But to get the numbers that NVIDIA produces on its marketing you know, material, you need to worry about this sort of thing. Um, you need to worry about how arithmetic are your kernels? How, how much work are you doing? And doing the optimization is hard. I did my own master's thesis on this, and it's just it's difficult. Um, it takes a long time, and for a company, I don't think it's super worth it to do. It's kind of the 80-20 rule. You know, you could probably get almost most of the percent, most of the performance you're going to get, you know, up front with minimal expenditure. To get that last 20%, you're going to spend a lot of money, a lot of time. So, um, oh, and lastly, it, it changes every day. Like now there's Python, and now there's caching, and they didn't have these things before. And they're not just like little things. I mean, when you add a level two cache, you're like, oh, that, that's kind of a big deal. That changes a lot of what you do and how your performance gets measured and all sorts of things. So, like, big changes happen relatively frequently. So, keep that in mind as well. But if you have any more questions, uh, feel free to send me an email. Like I can help you out. I think it's pretty neat stuff. So, yeah. Uh, are these slides available anywhere that we can? I can make them available, sure. If you email them to me, I can post them on the website with the video. Okay. Um, if we'd like to do, if you'd like to do more of a hands-on kind of thing, like look at code, I, I personally hate sitting in a room. Watching someone program and look at code, so I don't. I didn't have too much code here, um, but you know, it's it's pretty easy to 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 look at this stuff, and we can build it, and I can, you know, with maybe this amount of people, it wouldn't be so bad. Um, so if that's something you, you guys are interested in, just let us know, and we can, we can get that going. I don't know about the C cell and what the state of any of the GPUs or anything of there is, so. Um, I'm guessing that you can do this on, on yours, but I, I'm not sure. So, That's a good question. I I mean, if we wanted to do like a lab session on it, I could look into that. Yeah, I, it, you know, I, if more people have cross, interest, right, cross that bridge when we get to it. Yeah, it, it might be useful. Like I, I wanted this to be when you go and you actually download it and you look at it and you see these weird things, you kind of have an idea of what's going on. I didn't want this to be a total hands-on thing because. Like I said, watching you watching me code is worthless. Um, so, yeah, that's all I have. Thanks for coming, guys. All right, thank you. Uh, so, obviously, we're not doing this next week because we're on spring break. Um, after spring break, we're gonna, I haven't worked out the schedule yet, but there's going to be a probably multi-week series of lectures on using the Raspberry Pi. We have a set of Raspberry Pis, so they're not going to be in here. We'll probably do it in the C-cell so we can use the rest of the equipment in there. Um, 
but we're hopefully enough it'll be very hands-on. I mean, you'll get one to play with, so on and so forth. So I don't know if that's going to be the rest of the sessions after spring break. Uh, I'll probably need to fill that first session after spring break before everything's ready to go. So stay tuned. We'll email out the appropriate info, and have a good break. <laughs>